Tonight we're learning Parashat Chukat, and we are going to learn the holy words of Rabbi Leib Heyman. And tonight's class is dedicated in the merit and honor and memory of Rabbi Tzenchaya Heyman, Rabbi Leib's wife, who was his partner in, in life and partner in, in teaching Torah, spreading Torah, and, and leading, leading their community uh, first in Boston, and then in Yerushalayim and Bait Vagan, to great heights, great successful heights. So may tonight's class be in, in, in her merit, raising her neshama higher and higher. Thank you to Ron Mylene Friedman for, for dedicating that in her merit. Thank you and amen. So this week in Parashat Chukat, we read about the passing of Miriam Hanivia. This was during the last year of the Jewish people's travel in the land, uh, in the in the wilderness. Thirty-nine years have passed already, and now they find themselves during that last year. Miriam passes away. Take a look at your screen. Numbers chapter twenty, verse one. And the entire congregation of the Jewish people arrived at the desert of Tzin in the first month. That's the month of Nisan. And they, they settled, the people settled in Kadesh. And Miriam passed away and they buried her there. The Talmud in Masechet Moed Katan, also quoted to us by Rashi, tells us or asks the question, why is it that the passing of Miriam is juxtaposed next to the mitzvah of para aduma, the mitzvah of the sprinkling of the red heifer on the Jewish people? The Talmud answers, it's in order to teach us that just as the red heifer atones, so too does the passing of tzadikim, of righteous people, also atone. Then the Talmud continues and says, well, why is the passing of Aharon Kohen juxtaposed next to the garments, the details of the garments of the Kohanim? Also, to teach us, the Talmud answers, to teach us that just as the garments of the Kohanim atone, so too do the passing of righteous people also atone. Same idea. So Rabbi reminds us, the rule of this Talmud, of this Rashi, is the passing of righteous people provides atonement for the Jewish people. So Rabbi asks a very prominent question. He says, why was Miriam's passing specifically just juxtaposed next to paraduma and not any other type of offering or sacrifice right we saw this question in the zed shimshon as well so rebelly asks it also why specifically should miriam's passing be next to the red heifer and not any other type of sacrifice other sacrifices also provide atonement so rebelly answers and he says if we look at the end of our torah specifically in parashat vizot haberacha the last parasha when Moshe Rabbeinu blesses the Jewish people and actually each tribe individually before he passes on. When he comes to the tribe of Levi, he says the following. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 8. It says, Ule Levi amar, and to Levi he says, Tumecha ve'urecha li'ish hasidecha. Your tumim and urim belong to, you, to your pious men. That's talking about the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol. Belongs to the great priest. Whom you tested at Masa and whom you tried at the waters of Meriva. Rashi explains that Pasuk to tell us that Moshe Rabenu himself did not understand why Miriam and Aharon did not enter the land of Israel. They didn't sin. Moshe himself, he hit the rock instead of spoke to it. Okay. That's why he was not allowed to enter the land of Israel. To the Jewish people, they sinned with the golden calf and the sending in the spies and complaining and crying for that. So they were sentenced to not enter the land of Israel. But Miriam and Aaron, what did they do? They were still worthy, says, the, says Reb Leib, from the promise that Hashem made to the Jewish people. Take a look. This is in Exodus chapter 6, verse 8. Veheveti etchem el Hashem promised the Jewish people that I will bring you to the land concerning which I raised my hand to give to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. 
ונתתי אותה לכם, רשע אני השם, and I will give it to you as a heritage, I am the Lord. From here, this was the original verse, explains Reb Leib, that was a promise to the Jewish people that they were to enter the land of Israel. However, the Jewish people lost that promise because of the two grave sins, sin of the golden calf and sin of the sending of the spies and their response to the spies. And Moshe lost his opportunity because he hit, struck the rock. He hit the rock instead of spoke to it the second time. So Moshe understands that, that the Jewish people and himself don't really belong or are not supposed to or not merit of entering the land of Israel. But what about Miriam and Aharon? Why can't they enter the land of Israel? Explains Reb Leib a fascinating concept. He says, Moshe Rabbeinu, even though he's questioning it, Moshe Rabbeinu understands that it is a decree from Hashem that there's no explanation, there's no reason to why Miriam and Aharon do not enter the land of Israel. And it's a chok. A chok, there's different types of mitzvot that we have. There are certain mitzvot, commands that we have that we can understand. And there are certain which are called chukim, a chok, which is a non-rational mitzvah. It's a commandment that we do even though we do not understand. And this is why, explains Reb Leib, that the passing of Miriam is specifically put next to the red heifer because the red heifer is a chok. The Torah tells us that it is a chok. It is a mitzvah that we can't understand. It's beyond human comprehension. So just as Paraduma is beyond human comprehension, it's a chok. Miriam's passing was put next to it because also the passing of Miriam and Aharon is also a chok. It's also something that we can't understand. There's no reason why they shouldn't have entered the land of Israel. So now Reb says, how does this prove? Or rather, why is it, he says, why is it that the passing of a righteous person provides atonement? How does that really work? So he says, based on what we just explained, when a tzaddik passes away, there's no valid reason for their passing. So their time has come, but their passing is still deemed unjust, Reb Leib says. Any unjust passing means something that we cannot explain is a chok. It's something we cannot understand. And because we cannot understand, therefore it provides atonement to those who are left behind. Right? So let me repeat that. The reason why the passing of righteous people provide atonement is because their passing is untimely. It's not understood. And because it's not understood, it therefore provides atonement to those left behind. So Reblaid now just changes gear for one second. And this concept will, will, will explain the, the greater idea that he wants to prove from this whole idea of the passing of Miriam. He tells us, he reminds us that the world was created with a combination of chesed and din, with mercy and judgment. Learn this from the very beginning of the Torah and the Rashi is right at the beginning of our Torah. And because of this, that the world was created with this combination of mercy and judgment, any place we find din, judgment in a strong way, in a way that there's almost no bounds to them, mercy is sure to follow and make up for that hardship. And this helps us explain why after certain major or severe issues that took place, there's an overflow of abundance of mercy to follow. So what I'm about to say is a sensitive topic, and I'm literally quoting Reb Leib on this. So don't give me the merits for saying it, but don't uh, backfire if you don't like what you're about to hear at the same time. Reb Leib tells us, if you look at what happened during World War II and what followed World War II, we see this exact concept. And he explains. World War II, we saw 
one of the darkest and hardest times world history has Evans ever seen. At least modern history has ever seen. Nothing that sad and dark. No one can, can disagree with that. Right, obviously we know that people are trying to deny the Holocaust ever happened, but the Jewish people will never, ever forget what Hitler Yemach Shemo did to the Jewish people. Horrible. And what was to follow? What followed World War II? It's something that historians call the technological revolution. Like never before. For example, Rebleib says, a father who unfortunately was incarcerated, he was in jail, and he gets out of jail and he comes to see his children for the first time in months or years even. And he comes and he showers them with tons of gifts. What, what's the father trying to do? To make up for the missed time, to make up for the hardship of the separation. And he spoils the kids. If we look at right after World War II, the world developed in a way, and we obviously know that everything is controlled by Kadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem allowed it to. And I'll, and I'll prove that to you in a moment. But what happened right after World War II? Hashem allowed there to be a, a, an evolution of technology that made life in many ways so much easier and more comfortable. If it comes to scientific discoveries, medical successes, the ability to travel, the ability to communicate the way we do, the availability of information to the point where you could just Google anything. The information is at our fingertips that, that great professors and true intellects of previous generations couldn't even remember. And we have everything at the snap of a button. Electricity. Do you know that yesteryear when it got dark, every, everything shut down, everyone just went to sleep. Clean water, plumbing, just these simple, simple things that we take for granted, which for thousands of years were unavailable. Yet after one of the darkest periods in world history, HaKadosh Baruch Hu allowed it to all develop. And I'll say Hashem, obviously through messengers such as scientists and visionaries, obviously, this technological revolution really is something that took place. You know, you could argue if it's a 50 year span, it's a hundred year span, but that's, that's a drop of water in, in, in the bucket of time. So clearly it's, it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu which allowed this, all of these great technological revolutions, just to name a few. But Rebbe says, you know what the greatest gift is of all? The resettling of the land of Israel. The fact that after World War II, the Jewish people were able to come back home. Why is this, Rebleib explains? It's because of an overpour, a showering, an opening of the heavens that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave, full of mercy back to the Jewish people after all the suffering they went through during World War II. Rebleib says there's no coincidence that all of this is to follow that terrible suffering of innocent men, women, and children, and most important, righteous tzaddikim. Righteous, righteous people. Because based on Hashem's own traits, the way He showed Himself to us through His Torah and through history, the suffering that took place in, during World War II should have never happened. But it happened, and we cannot understand why it happened. And anyone who wants to give an explanation or reason why it happened is false, because that level of suffering is a chok. It's something beyond human comprehension. It's a chok just like paraduma is a chok. 
It's a chok, just like we learned from, from moments ago from, from the Zashim Shan. Miriam's passing is ununderstandable, uncomprehensible. We cannot. However, Hashem did allow it to happen after all, the World War II. And because he allowed it to happen, for such hardship, HaKadosh Baruch Hu kind of had to make up for it. He had to make up for it with extra mercy. And the result of that extra mercy is all those amazing technological advancements and commodities and comforts that we all have today, which provide for an easier and more comfortable lifestyle. And Rebbe says this phenomenon is not the first or one of a kind. This happened before, this idea of Hashem having to pay back for suffering, we see. We see, and Rebbe proves through, through the Midrash and through different verses in the Torah, that look at Kriyat Yam Suf, the splitting of the sea, of, the Jew, of when the Jewish people were stuck by the Sea of Reeds. How come did Hashem make this extra miraculous phenomenon of splitting the sea, letting them go through, the Egyptians drowning, then giving them all their wealth? Also, anyone that went through the sea was healed. Why did the Jewish people deserve such a, such a blessing? Miracles being saved, health, wealth. It's a payback, explains Reb Leib. It's a payback for all the suffering that the Jewish people endured at the hands of the Egyptians in Egypt. To pay back for all that, Hashem had an overpour of mercy to follow. Again, similar to like the concept of World War II. So now, Rebbe says, now that we explained the reason why Miriam's passing is juxtaposed next to Paraduma, and why the death of righteous people really provide atonement, and then we also just understood this idea that of Hashem sometimes, not sometimes, does pay back after tremendous hardships, he's got a question. His question is, what is it that the passing of Miriam and Aharon provide atonement for? And who did they provide atonement for? How, who, what? Meaning, if they're passing away, these righteous people, which atonement, what are they providing for? We don't see anything change for the better, right? After Miriam passes away, they lost the water. After Anne passes away, they lose, they lose the clouds of glory. If anything, they're only losing things to Jewish people. What atonement? Again, this is the, 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 the Reb Leib's question. What atonement is provided for the Jewish people after the passing of Miriam and Aharon? So Reb Leib answers based on a Tosafot, which is the Bibl uh, Talmudic commentary on Masechet Baba, Baba Batra, page 121. Every single year of the 40 years when the Jewish people were traveling in the, wind, wind, in the wilderness, the, there were 15,000 Jews that passed away. If you take 15,000 times 40, that's your 600,000. Those were the 600,000 that had to pass away after the, after the um, golden calf and the sin of the spies, changing that generation over so that they could not enter the land of Israel. Correct? There's difference of opinions. It doesn't really matter which opinion because the answer goes well either way. But one opinion is that 15,000, the last 15,000 did not pass away in the 40th year. And another opinion is only those who were exactly 20 years old, 40 years ago, didn't pass away. But not to get into the intricacy of that dispute, at the end of the day, that last year, that 40th year, on Tisha Be'av, when every other year people passed away, no one passed away that year. That last portion of people that were supposed to pass away, even though they were decreed to pass away not into the land of Israel, actually survived. Rebbe says, why didn't they pass? They should have passed away like every other year. They were originally included in the decree to pass away, to die in the wilderness. Why didn't Hashem follow through with that promise? Comes Reb Laban says, it was the passing of Miriam and Aharon that provided atonement for that last group of people. That last 15,000 didn't pass away because Miriam and Aharon passed away instead. 
And Reb Leib says, this is the calculation. The Jewish people were sentenced and punished to traveling in the wilderness and passing away and not entering the land of Israel because of the two great sins committed. Sin of the golden calf and sin of the spies. Those who didn't pass away on the 40th year, they shouldn't have been excused. But Miriam's passing in Nisan, which was juxtaposed in the Torah next to the Paraduma, because they're both Chukim, right? They're both not understandable. They're way beyond our comprehension. Para Aduma, the red heifer, is a clear atonement for the sin of the golden calf. That's the first reason. Now move on to the month of Av. On the first of Av, when Aharon passes away. Aharon passes away which in the month of Av, which is the same month as the sin of the spies, which is on Tisha B'Av. Teaching us that Aharon's passing atoned for the sin of the spies. So that last group of 15,000 who were supposed to pass away for those two sins, golden calf and spies, well, the golden calf was now atoned for because Miriam passed away, and the sin of the spies was atoned for because now Aaron, Aaron Cohen passed away. So from here, we now understand that when the Talmud tells us that the righteous people's passing does provide atonement, it provided atonement, in this case, Miriam and Aaron's passing, for that last group on the 40th year for those two grave sins, the sin of the golden calf and the spies. This is uh, Reb, Leib's, Reb Leib's beautiful and fascinating uh, interpretation. Just as, as, a, as a lesson, I think the idea of true righteous people is, is, is almost foreign to us. We all know great people. We all know successful people. We all know caring people. We may call people righteous and tzaddikim, but a true tzaddik is, 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 is a level above anything most of us has, have ever even met. The Gedolei Israel, the, 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 the true leaders of our nation, those are tzaddikim, those are righteous, meritous people. T -t to name some would be, would, be, would be hard. Meaning, of course, there was great, great, great Gedolim and, and leaders even, even in, in our modern history, in our own lifetimes. And it, it's very, very hard for us to understand the idea that that person should have not even passed away. It's only our, B'nai Israel's fault that they actually had to pass on. And I, I think it, it just reminds us, at the end of the day, we're all human. We all need to try our hardest, try our best. But a real, real righteous person is always making the right decisions. Is always, and it doesn't mean they don't have the conflict. They always have that battle and that conflict of the Yetzirah and Yetzirah Tov. But they're always making that right decision. I'll tell you a, an example of one tzaddik. Has anyone ever heard of Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu? Zecher Tzadik Livracha. Ramodecha Eliyahu was uh, one of the chief rabbis of Israel. Uh, I don't know, four, let's say four times, four chief rabbis ago. Let's put it that way. I think it's four or five around then. No, let's say four. And he was a very, very powerful leader. He was a great, great Torah scholar. He was loved by all. That was one thing that Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu had because he had the ultra-religious Jews adore him, but he also had those which were not ultra-religious adore him as well. And he combined, he didn't make any difference between, between uh, your, your Zionist or your not Zionist. He embraced all in a fascinating way. I had the merit of meeting him a couple times. It was absolutely amazing. And in a very short period of time, I think it was even one year, he got sick. I think it was cancer, very quick, and he passed away super, super quick. I believe I was even at his levaya. I'm almost positive. And when his wife, the Rebbitzin, was asked, how come so quick? How could it be that your husband left us so quick? She shared with those that asked her, very scary, scary story she said 
that right before her husband got sick and was diagnosed with cancer, he had a dream. He had a dream and you could say a malach, an angel, some, some, something, a Hashem, a malach, we don't know who, came to him in a dream and told him that something very, very severe and hard is going to happen to the Jewish people. But if you'd like to volunteer yourself to atone for that and to spare that for the Jewish people, you may do so. And, he, and so he did. He accepted the pain and the burden on himself and his own passing, his untimely passing, in order to spare the rest of Klal Yisrael. And that's a true leader. That's a tzaddik. Nowadays, you, you see a little kid, he says, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet. Oh, he's a tzaddik, he's a tzaddik. We, 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 when we say that, we pray for him. We're, we're hoping that they become a tzaddik. But a real tzaddik is few and far between. And I, I guess our, our goal in life is to be working in that direction and to never give up but also to appreciate the true definition of a tzaddik. And when we're in the midst of one, when we have the availability to be next to one, to get a beracha from one, to hasten that opportunity and, and, and go and do it. So in, in merit of Rabbi Leib Heyman and in memory of Rebbe Tzinchaya, who today was her yard site, May we bezrat Hashem merit to work in that direction towards to be true tzaddikim and tzadkaniyot. And as we pray on a daily basis that our children will follow bederech Torah mitzvot in the ways of Torah and mitzvot. And that they too will be righteous and make the right decisions in the chaos of a world that we live in. To make those decisions based on our tefillot, based on the education we provide them with, based on having passed down our heritage from our grandparents to our parents to us, and hopefully over to the next generations to continue passing down the torch of Torah, Emunah, and Bitachon. Amen v'amen. If anyone has any questions... I just want to get as a disclaimer, there are many, many more tzaddikim, righteous people that this world has had. And I just, off the top of my head, chose to speak about Rabbi Mordechai Liyahu. There are plenty more, but I just, I just, I think I wanted to impress upon us the, the concept that every tzaddik that we are sp- told about, they may not really be a tzaddik, right? So even me, myself, in a nice way, sometimes, you know, you'll call me and I'll say, hi, tzaddik. It's a nice thing to do. But, but for a moment, we have to just really understand what a tzaddik is, who was really a, a tzaddik. Okay, with that, with that, Bechavod, anyone have anything to, to share? And it's, it's when you say, when you label someone as a tzaddik, you give him the hope, just like you, you label someone bad, they say, don't label him. But to label a tzaddik, it's beautiful. Beautiful. Then you're looking forward. Yeah, thank you. It was beautiful, really. Thank you. Any questions? Isaac, we know you have a question. I'm still chewing uh, in my brain. My question is for me, but I'm still chewing the concept that you said. Uh, in the Haftarah, every time one of the prophets comes, this bad is going to happen and this bad is going to happen. But at the end, look, look, everything Hashem is going to forgive you. So, so this concept, of uh, World War II and then something good happening. And it's a very Jewish concept that uh, it's, uh, uh, that if you, if you feel very bad, you have, God forbid, not you, somebody feels very bad having this, and that, but at the end of the tunnel, you know, you're gonna be rewarded. This, uh, this is a, a concept that, I'm, that I, I, I'm trying to still chew it because you can apply it to, to a lot of things. You know, it's part it's of us. It's a warning. It's a warning that the, the Navi, the prophet was, was giving to the Jewish people. And uh, the second thing, uh, if I can formulate the question. Uh, so I asked the same question to uh, Rabbi Galamiri the other day. 
uh, I was a little bit upset that uh, Miriam, I didn't think has it, I didn't think of her, but I was, uh, I was talking about, uh, uh, I was talking about uh, Aaron and I said, it's not fair. Look, Moshe, he's the rock. And then Aaron gets punished with him. I said, where's the justice over here? And he says, yeah, well, look, look what happened. Uh, actually, it's not going to be a question. <laughs> it's something I said, look, what happened is that he was a witness and he didn't do anything. Bystander effect. Bystander effect. Exactly. Uh, so th this is one of the other things. And then, and then I said, so, so, okay, so why, why, why? I said, think about it. Maybe I said, and then I volunteer a question and he didn't disagree with me. I said, perhaps they didn't enter the land of Israel because what would happen if Moshe enters, if Miriam enters, in this case that I forgot to ask, and if uh, Aaron enters, um, people might, I, 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 it might be idolatry because people might, might idolize them, uh, just like I have done to all the people who have died who are very famous, you know. Uh, well, if they don't see the grave, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy to, uh, to do that, you know. Right. That's why it's one of that the- specific, uh, yes, that is definitely, yes. We were looking for reasons, you know, the unknown. This could be one of the unknowns. I don't know. No questions yep. today. <laughs> okay, good, good. Uh, Eileen has a question. No, I don't. It was really just a very beautiful class. Of course, you always challenge our brain. Rabbi challenges our brain. But it's a beautiful, beautiful class. And um, that's a hoax, right? Sometimes we can't always understand it, but we know we have to believe it. So I think it was beautifully said, even as hard as it is to wrap our brains around, because that's the whole point of the hope for me. So yeah. well done. And we're not, and we're not saying that the that what followed, let's say the technological advancements, was worth or huh. made up for, or made up for the World War II. But it's just a a fact of life. It's a phenomenon. Something we can never understand. Um, for that matter, why are we kosher? We can't understand it. It's because the Torah says. Exactly. Because truth is a hook also. It's another hook. So I have to look at it with that same perspective because it is beyond our um, comprehension. And that's in the world of Hashem. So I think you did a beautiful job in explaining everything. And once again, you gave beautiful merit. And um, I know souls up there are flying high. We hope, we hope, we hope. Thank you, thank you. You're a Sadiq rabbi. <laughs> no, don't, don't say that. <laughs> I second it, yeah. Thank you. Yes, very nice. It's a nice uh, Yehuda has a question. Thank you, Eileen, thank you. It may or may not be related. I'm not sure if it's Hukat or Bechukotai. I remember a few years back, I gave in service to a group of pharmaceutical managers about the origins of medicine and I think there is a section of about 10 small um, psukim that talk about the Nechashim. And um, th th there was a big magifa of Nechashim. And the Israelites were crying for water and everything. And also say, hey, save us from the Nechashim. And he gave them some sort without R&D, the venue of Nechashim to heal them or prevent things from killing them. And that's why we have Nachash Nechoshet, I remember. And that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu this, took a, a he took a, a, a grass, a copper, a copper, uh, what's it called? Right. A copper snake, and he oh. put it on a stick, and he lifted it for all to look up at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was during Amalek War, no? No, no, no. It's really in this no, part. no. That was later. That was like he said when they were complaining. Oh. Yeah, and then they complained about water. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I remember that. Um, but there is a